have some space, maybe? Uh, not a lot. It depends. So what we're going to hope for is this new I just want to put this address, but I can't, the slash, I, sorry, I know this is a German keyboard. I don't know, I have to do it. It's an L. Which one? It's no, L. No, no, it's not an L. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, a line. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. it's sort of a dash. No. No, <laughs> no I, I, I just use the upper dash because mm. uh, in, in German you have to use the upper dash. Um, so okay. How do I do it? Press this and this? No, yeah. just, just press this. Oh, press this. Oh, yeah. great. Okay, perfect. And then I'll just so it this should be like yeah. Um, T F T F K O H. Okay, I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah. Thank you so much for your help. Yeah, the keyboard is configured.
Hey, are you here for the session? Come close. There's um, yeah, tell, yeah. a few of us, but I mean, there are. And we're going to do a couple of interactive events. Is it a meeting? Oh, it's so, usually like a little, you know. But to begin with, I'll just present the agenda. Yeah. So, yeah, the closer you get, the yeah. better. Are you allowed to like move this? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to the Civil Society Coordination event. We'll start in about five minutes, um, just because we, were, we got a few RSVPs. This is an RSVP-only event. I feel really uncivil society by saying that, <laughs> saying that, but there's a reason for that. Um, we're planning to strategize and to um, coordinate. So if you aren't a civil society organization that is interested in doing that, um, be aware, be aware of that. I'm not gonna kick you out. <laughs> I'm just telling you so you can make an informed decision. Um, so we're, we're waiting for Bruna, who is a co-coordinator of the Internet Governance Caucus, that this event is um, um, really uh, designed around. So if you will be patient with me and just wait for five minutes, that would be appreciated. And we'll get started, thank you. everybody to kind of move in, maybe like the first five rows. We really want to yeah, have a discussion. Yeah, and that's, this, is each, this is meant to be a discussion, not a uh, presentation. Yeah. So everyone so. in. We're going to be great friends by the end of this. So yeah.
Okay, I don't know what's holding up um, Bruna. I'm, I'm sitting here because I wanted to take you through the agenda, but welcome to this civil society coordination meeting. My name is Sheetal Kumar and I am a program lead at Global Partners Digital um, and I wear this other hat which is co-coordinator of the Internet Governance Caucus. Um, and so I'd like to welcome you here. Bruna and I will both be leading this meeting, but until she arrives, it will just be me. Um, quick question for you all. Who here is a member of the IGC? Okay. <laughs> Some people are not sure. Who has not heard of IGC? Okay, great. So about three people. So we're going to do a um, intro into the IGC a little bit later, but just to give you what you need to know, I think at this point, the IGC or Internet Governance Caucus is a global network of civil society organizations that are committed to coordinating um, on internet policy issues. And it has been around for more than a decade and um, has an, so it has a long history um, that has, it has recently been revived because it was inactive for a couple of years. Um, it's a tradition of the IGC to host a pre uh, event before the IGF. So here we are, that's what we're doing. We're convening before the IGF as civil society organizations to identify common priorities, hopefully, um, and strategize. So that is the aim of um, the IGC, in order to be a member, you have to simply commit to the charter. Here it is. Well, here's the, um, on the screen, I don't know if you can see it. Anyway, um, there is a charter which you um, are very welcome to read and to become a member if you, if you sign up to this charter. So it is pretty straightforward, really. Um, what I wanted to do is first do um, some brief introductions, but to make it more interactive, um, ask you to turn around to the person next to you um, and tell them your name, your organization, and what you would like to get out of the next three hours or two and a half hours. Let's say, what would you like to get out of this event? Um, I'll give you a couple minutes to do that, and then if you can remember those things, um, and then tell everyone else in the group, that would be a great start, I think. And then we'll go into the agenda um, and, and start t tackling some of the questions um, in the agenda. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, so now I'm gonna get up. So yes, please turn around to the person next to you, name, organization, and what you'd like to get out of it.
nobody's really choosing. Hello. Okay, everyone. Um, hopefully you've learned a lot about each other. It sounds like there's a lot to learn, which is wonderful. And um, Bruna has joined us. Bruna? Hi, everyone. Um, introductions? Just, yes. yeah. So Bruna Santos, one of the, the other IGC co-coordinator and Brazilian working for coding rights. And that's it. Great. So both Bruna and I assumed our roles of co-coordinator co-coordinator, yes, a couple of months ago. Um, and as I explained earlier, this was a tradition of um, the Civil Society Network to convene before the IGF every year. Um, and so we are reviving that tradition and really hoping that we can collectively identify priorities and coordinate going forward. Um, so thank you for coming. I'm going to hand over to you guys to introduce each other, and then we'll get stuck into our agenda. Um, and as you're uh, explaining what you'd like to get out of the event, I'll be just taking some notes to make sure that we, the agenda reflects what you want. So Peter, can I start with you? Hi, I'm Peter. Um, I'm uh, glad to introduce Nick. Uh, from the Internet Society, uh, formerly with the UK. Nick's here uh, to learn more about our community and how we work and how IGC works. And uh, specifically, he's interested in the impact of the Internet on the environment and, um, and climate and sustainability issues. Welcome, Nick. Hi everyone, my name is Ephraim. Uh, I would like to introduce Peter, uh, who's a global counsel at Access Now. Uh, he's uh, interested in collaborating and uh, finding ways to uh, better network with everyone here to ensure that uh, we achieve all our uh, various objectives. Yeah. Amazing. Should we, should we go here? Yes. Jazz things up a bit. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Nidhi and I'm introducing Susan, who's the founder of CertSkate. And she's here because she wants to hear what all the other civil societies are doing and how she can better coordinate with them and meet their needs. And I'm Susan and I'm here to introduce Nidhi. And she wants to find out how um, the civil society will be impacting, different civil societies will be impacting what CCG is doing in New Delhi. Okay. You Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm coming. I'm, I'm introducing Dima from Access Now. Uh, uh, she's based in Tunis and works on all the MENA region, uh, and she has a particular interest in data protection, cyber laws, and she's uh, mainly here to uh, have some better coordination and understanding of uh, what is everybody doing, and also have another perspective from different countries around the world. Uh, hi, I would like to introduce uh, uh, my friend uh, Camille. Uh, he uh, works for Reporters, uh, with, uh, Reporters Without Borders, and um, he is here to learn about more initiatives um, about like um, about uh, privacy, freedom of expression, uh, like from other regions, and uh, what else did you say? <laughs> yeah, and uh, content moderation as well. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Hi, uh, I would like to introduce to Itaru. Uh, he works for a private company working for the Japanese government. Uh, they provide secu cyber security uh, advising for the government. And he would like to uh, try to engage more with civil society and try to be part of, of the community and, and work with us. Uh, thank you, Gaspar. Uh, and uh, he's uh, Gaspar from the uh, Access Now, and uh, he working uh, in uh, uh, Russian policy field. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yes. And, yes. And he's uh, host, and uh, he's from the 
Rima Community uh, Risk Information Management work, and uh, he uh, said he's represented in the oldest <laughs> uh, people in this uh, room. Uh, <laughs> that's all. Hello, um, my name is Amy. I'm here to introduce Tamara. Um, Tamara is from Freedom House. Um, she's here to learn more about the IGC and civil society coordination and talk about the really good work Freedom House is doing in emergency assistance for civil society and NGOs. Hi, my name is Tamara and I'm here to introduce Amy McKinnon who works at Global Partners Digital and she's here to learn more about the work of IGF. Um, also, if I can just say, I'll leave all sorts of information about our emergency assistance since all the people in civil society need it, if anyone wants to grab. Thank you. I'm Alberto. I will introduce Koliwe. Koliwe works in the, uh, she's over there. Um, she works in the African program of uh, the Association for Progressive Communication, and she's particularly interested in learning what is the stage of communalities that civil society has to work together over the course of the following years. Thanks, hi, I'll introduce Alberto. He's with the Ford Foundation and he's here to sort of identify whether there actually are any commonalities um, across the divide, civil society, and whether globally um, there could be meeting points and how Ford Foundation can contribute to that. Hi, I want to introduce uh, Keith uh, from Rizomatica. Um, they, are, they used to be a civil society organization and now just last year were registered as a private organization. Um, so they deal in spectrum management and then security as well. So this is his first time and he's here to learn um, the operations, what we do in the civil society and then also to participate. Yeah. Hi, I will introduce Kenneth, and I would really encourage you to uh, talk to him yourself because I'm terrible at this. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't really do it. So, so basically, I was telling we what we do, Agro, we promote um, um, kind of multi-stakeholder approach, I mean, that from uh, GPD um, in cybersecurity policy development, and then also digital rights. And Keith is new to digital rise, kind of, so he wanted me to speak myself. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Daniel, and I want to introduce Veronica and Karel, who are from the um, Association for Progressive Communication, and uh, which is a decentral organization all over the world with, without a local office, what I understood, correct me afterwards. <laughs> um, so they take the opportunity to meet them um, with other um, activists here and also um, yeah, put their uh, topics into the discussion. So far what I understood, thanks. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, we don't have an office. Uh... This is Veronica. I'm going to introduce Daniel. He's an academic, a sociologist working on, in human rights and technology. And he's interested in that intersection, both at this meeting and IGF in general. I don't know, Carol, do you want to add something? No. Uh, thank you. Sorry, hi. I'm Arsen Tungali. Um, uh, a former co-coordinator of the uh, IGC. I'd like to introduce my new friends, Meru, who comes from uh, Japan. Korea, Korea sorry. Uh, he works for, uh, he's an activist with uh, Jimbo Nets, and he's uh, also, I mean, his organization is a member of uh, the APC, uh, a member organization of the APC network. Thank you, and my name is Biru, exactly, and I'm from Korea, and I'm gonna introduce Arsene. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. He's from the Congo and he's working for the digital rights in there. And he is also a member of APC, right? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> we didn't introduce. Thank you. Yeah, we need to introduce this guy, but I think everyone knows who he is. I'd like to, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend Ephraim. He's officially a legend. Um, and, uh, and he's always impeccably dressed as well. He's always looks smarter than me. Uh, we met, we were just discussing when we met. We think it's about 2015 uh, in Brazil, but I can't remember it. Um, which means it probably did happen. Uh, Ephraim works for Article 19, uh, who are involved in defending uh, freedom of expression and information. Uh, we're also counterparts on ICANN's non-commercial stakeholder group. Um, and, uh, and Ephraim is here this week to discuss a range of issues, uh, but also importantly, he mentioned to me to be able to meet lots of people and, uh, and network and find out what's, uh, what's important to people. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We've got such a great group of people here, and I've heard a lot of wanting to learn um, more about the IGC um, as one priority for the next few hours. Um, is it something everyone wants to get out of this? Secondly, identifying common priorities where we can coordinate. That's definitely something Bruna and I wanted to get out of this, so it's good to hear that you also want to do that. Um, and, and I think, yeah, identifying where we can um, work together is, is also a priority for everyone, which is great to hear. Um, I'm just going to uh, show you the agenda again that we crowdsourced on the IGC list. So, ah, here. Wow, this is so great that everything just pops up. Thank you to everyone at the back. So, um, what, what we'll do now is go through the agenda, and then Bruna, who has been part of the IGC network for a while, um, said she would be happy to take you through a very brief lightning tour history of the IGC. How did we get here? Um, and then we'll go into the breakout groups. So what we were thinking was, um, with a break or two in between, not to worry, um, that we would discuss the following issues, which are on the screen, you, sh you can see that we crowdsourced on the uh, IGC list as being of interest to people to discuss and identify where we can be working together. So one is multi-stakeholder initiatives, the other is sustainable development, third, content regulation, fourth, state behavior in cyberspace, so cybercrime, for example. Emerging technologies was the fifth idea for what we can discuss. Um, just, I just want to make sure that everyone's okay with that format, where we would break out into groups and then discuss um, the issue, places or forums where these issues are being discussed and possible messages that IGC could have. Is there, are there any reactions to that idea? We don't have to agree all of the breakout groups now. We can go back to that and make sure that everyone is, um, everyone is able to discuss what they want to discuss. But how about that as an idea? Any Disagreement with this or comments? Yeah. Since the room is not so fantastically crowded um, as expected, maybe, but nevertheless, uh, these breakout groups would be just five people. And uh, um, I think it also could be interesting to, to give um, 15 minutes uh, or uh, 10 minutes uh, to each of the breakout topics and discuss it in plenary, uh, rather than breaking out and repeating that discussion about five people with 15 people or something. That, that is a duplication of time uh, use, uh, to my impression. Okay. So the idea there was to um, discuss all of those topics in plenary. Um, does anyone have any reactions to that or another idea? Right. Can you just? Yeah, you were looking at me, but you didn't say anything. Uh, no, I was thinking if maybe we can. I know that we have a lot of topics, but what about adding the selling of the dot org domain to the list of discussion? The selling of the dot org domain. Okay. So, so yeah. Okay. Yep. 
Selling.org domain, um, that's an issue that has become recently very um, of, of great concern to many people here, so we'll add that to the list. So um, I think that there might not be enough time, unfortunately, for everyone to discuss in plenary each of these topics. Um, so perhaps we can do a show of hands for people who are interested in discussing. I'm getting the impression that people do want to discuss topics and identify priorities, so we'll stick to that. Um, do a show of hands for each um, idea, and then um, maybe just identify the top two or three and go with those, and the other ones can be discussed um, if we have time. How does that sound? Okay, great. Yes, I love that. I think we need to teach everyone this um, consensus building uh, participatory method. But anyway, so to start with, um, let's go with content regulation. Can we have the agenda up again? Sorry. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so, okay, multi-stakeholder initiatives, including the high-level panel. Who's interested in discussing that? That would be their priority. Okay, there's three, four, five people. Okay, noted. Sustainable development. Slightly three people. Okay, excellent. Um, content regulation, including Christchurch call. There's quite a lot of support for discussing that. Okay, good to note. Um, state behavior in cyberspace. So the plan was to discuss cy the cybercrime discussions in the third committee of the UN. Okay. Five, okay. Um, and emerging technologies, a artificial intelligence, IoT, about five as well. And finally, .org and this sale of .org. Okay, so that's um, about the same as for content regulation. So content regulation, the sale of .org, um, and cybercrime and emerging technologies had similar um, similar support. So what I suggest is we go with those and we do breakout groups but not for very long and then we discuss mainly in plenary. Does that sound okay for people? So we go with those four after um, Bruna does a brief overview of the IGC. We'll give you a couple minutes and then if anyone has any questions we can do the questions then and then we'll go into the breakout groups. Does that sound okay? Great be very brief on this, but um, who of everybody here knows the story of IGC? Is any, like, how many of you have been members or similar to that? Great. Um, but anyways, IGC was a process in a civil society gathering that started back at the beginning of the WISIS process, so the, the back in 2003, 2005. And I will, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I, sorry. It's all right. Um, so yeah, IGC was um, mostly a civil society gathering that was formed back at the beginning of the WISIS process in order to facilitate um, civil society coordination. Are we doing acronyms now? <laughs> Might have to. I don't know WISIS by, by memory. <laughs> that's it, World Summit on Information Society. Yeah, that's it, thank you very much. And um, so the idea for IGC, Internet Governance Calculus, was to provide this space for exchange of views and, and better um, instruct advocacy around the internet issues um, and for the, the upcoming future. So we have been around for a while. And um, one of the, in this past two years, one year, this past year mostly, we have been um, trying to shape uh, or trying to rebuild the Internet Governance Caucus because we, we, know, we know that along the years, um, a few other civil society organizations and gatherings, they, they came up and they were formed. So we have really cool networks and, and people working around the same issues. So just, just Net Coalition, we have APC and we have uh, other few groups. And then um, the idea for this past year was to kind of reshape what IGC used to be and go back to the stage in which we provided um, this sort of exchange between civil society organizations and individuals. So very briefly, this will be it. Questions, views, thoughts, anything? Anything I forgot to mention? I think there is, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. You, you have quite a lot of voice. Mic, right? 
Uh, I think there was questions about like what um, what people use IGC to do, and like what kind of outputs um, it has. Thanks. So at the very beginning, the idea was to kind of instruct civil society participation at the WISIS process. And throughout, um, we used to do this um, day zero event and day zero coordinations um, to participate at the IGF and all the other IG forums. Um, and that's pretty much the idea um, moving forward. So I guess will be it. Oh yeah, and our charter. So um, in our charter, as I said, the mission is to provide a forum for discussion, advocacy, and representation of civil society contributions. So we're not mostly talking about the IGF, we're also talking about ICANN, WISIS, and every single other forum around this subject. So, yep. Okay, thank you, Bruna. Any other questions about the Internet Governance Caucus? What it is, why it is, how it is, what, what it is, <laughs> anything? Yeah, I was just wondering if you had other types of activities during the year or if it's just only during the IGF. That's an excellent question, Kemi, and I think that is the, um, the answer to that is we really hope so. Um, because for the last couple of years there hasn't been um, any activities, but in the past what used to happen is the network used to convene online, um, for example, statements around key forums or situations. So joint um, or general statements as inputs into, for example, the ITU, the UN processes, the WTO, et cetera, that would convey messages from civil society. And that hasn't been happening because the network was disbanded or wasn't officially disbanded, but was inactive. So what we're hoping is that happens again. And um, just to mention that, just pretty much similar to other forums and arenas, we kind of do the convening on the mailing list. So that's pretty much the space for discussion. So when we say it was disbanded, it's like we had some issues in servers and participation around it. So part of this reshaping is bringing new people in and restarting everything. So, yep. Um, Horst Kramers, uh, Berlin. Um, my question would be being, being not only oldie, but also newbie here in the uh, IGC. Um, my question would be, does that represent uh, civil society here. Uh, how large? How, how large is the IGC? Um, is it uh, a membership of a handful of uh, good, willing people, or uh, what do you think would be the um, the greater effort uh, to reach, or how do you reach out to society? Not just make meetings of well-meaning people, but how to reach out to society. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So one of the aims that we have is to um, ensure that more people who are already in the network are active um, and participating on the list. So I think there, there are definitely more than 100 people on the list um, from all over the world. So it's a global um, network. And there are some very active members and some less active members. But the idea is that those who are active, or those who would like to be active, who subscribe to the vision and the mission of this network, find ways to coordinate and come together outside the IGF, um, in between IGFs, um, and on concrete processes. Does that make sense to people? Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. How is um, or are civil societies being defined? Because sometimes they will include education and some of the other um, disciplines that promote the development of mankind. Um, that's the eternal and multi, uh, yeah, million dollar question. Um, well, uh, the way that civil society is defined in, in the Charter is, um, I think, not too controversial, but it will always be a controversial definition, depending on who you speak to. So um, the, uh, the, the way we understand civil society are those public interest groups that work um, for the public interest. Um, it encompasses a very wide range of groups, from research groups, we might think tanks, activists, um, those who ultimately um, 
subscribe to the vision and mission of the charter and, and work towards the public interest, I think is the way that we would define it. Um, it you know, some of this is self-definition. If you self-identify as civil society, there are some characteristics that you do have to abide by, but it's not, um, it's not incredibly strict. Um, and I think the abiding principle is working towards the public interest. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. Often be not for profit organizations, but I would say it, it doesn't have to be, probably. Um, uh, media organizations often are included in civil society, and those might be for profit. Um, yeah, it's not a very exclusive group, and I think IGC doesn't often uh, or maybe ever like speak on behalf of the people who are on the list. It's, it's more like a platform for people on the list to organize themselves. Exactly. Thanks, Peter. So it is a platform um, for organization um, amongst a very wide range of groups that generally, I think that's one of the things that we would like to identify today, what brings people together that are brought together around common concerns, um, like you said, are generally not-for-profit and non-governmental as well. Um, and, and so that's, that's hopefully an answer to your question. <laughs> Susan, thank you. Anyone else in terms of questions for, for us on the IGC? Thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, in my sort of understanding of the landscape, there's a variety of different uh, organizations who all have uh, a role that they play uh, uh, within this environment. Um, so my, uh, you know, where people from civil society can engage as well. Uh, my question to you is, um, what is the IGC's unique selling point? What is the IGC going to do uniquely uh, to contribute to this, uh, this community of civil society groups? Well, I can say what I hope um, it will do, which is bring together civil society organizations from around the world, so um, from all regions of the world, um, to work together, particularly at the global level, to identify common priorities um, and processes where a common voice would be more impactful than disparate voices. So I think it is the only truly global network of its kind of civil society groups working on internet policy issues. So in that sense, it's unique. Um, we just have to do more coordination. One thing that the list definitely already does is information sharing, but the next step is, is coordinating around the issues that we've identified. No, and if I may add, the idea is not to like um, become and not become or even like kind of um, disrespect the other or networks and organizations work so far because we do acknowledge that throughout history they're depending on um, the needs and the discussions, a lot of other networks they, they ended up existing. So the idea is more to reintegrate this discussion and kind of help like connecting the dots around this, this subject, so, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so what we'll do then is uh, break out into our groups, um, and then we'll have a little break after that before we come back. Um, so these are the three questions. I'm highlighting them with my cursor. You can see on the screen. Um, which we thought would be really helpful for every group to identify. So. We've identified four issues that everyone would like to discuss in some shape or form. The sale of .org, um, content regulation, cybercrime, and emerging technologies. So I'm not going to tell you exactly how to define those th things. One of the key tasks is to define the issue and the problem as you see it that needs to be solved in your group. The second is what are the key forums and spaces at the international level where this issue is being discussed. So for example, with um, content regulation, it might be the Christchurch call, the G G20, where else is content regulation being discussed at the international level? At the IGF, exactly. Um, and emerging technologies. So you are all the experts on where these issues are being discussed. Um, so after you have identified the problem or the issue, if you can highlight maybe four or five key spaces where this issue is being discussed by policymakers and by others, 
do that. And then finally, what are some messages you collectively think as a network, as civil society, we could be taking to the table in these forums over the next year? Um, that would be a really great beginning, I think, to identifying possible opportunities for coordination. Um, any questions before we start? Does anyone not understand the topic, uh, the task? Okay, so if you um, please put up your hand if you're interested in the .org breakout group. Pretty much everyone was, who, who would prefer to talk about that one? No, okay. Um, yes, one, two, oh, the mic. Hi. When it comes to the, the selling of .org, since I saw there was a lot of interest, wouldn't we do that one as plenary directly and, and remove that from the breakout groups? I think we can, I think we can do it, yeah. Um, we can do that. Content regulation. Should we? Yep. So one, two. Okay. So let's say on this side of the group, we discuss content regulation. This side of the um, room, we decide, uh, discuss content regulation. Um, and then the other one was cybercrime. Who's interested in that? Discussing that as an issue? Okay. So that will be this side of the room on the left. Um, and emerging technologies. Let's see if there's enough interest in that now. Still? Okay. All right. So, emerging technologies will be at the back. Um, and it was um, content regulation here on, the, on my right. And on my left is cybercrime. So, over the next 40 minutes, if you can get in your groups, um, and collectively identify what the issue is. So how will you frame the issue? Second, where, are the, where is this issue being discussed at the international level? And finally, what are some key messages that you think the IGC could take to those forums? All right, so I'm going to ask everyone to get up um, and move to your spaces. So where Bruna is is content regulation. Come and meet her here. Emerging tech is at the back. And cybercrime is here with me. So we'll give you 40 minutes and then we'll come back. Yes, please. As for the new emerging topics that you asked for, is that, have you defined it anyway or, or any, anything? We haven't defined emerging technologies, no. Um, but that's, that's sort of for the group to discuss. It includes, oh. Yeah, it was. Um, so, what the idea is that these are the issues and topics, and then there are forums where these issues are being discussed, and those are what you will identify. And then afterwards, we can discuss what are the other issues that we've missed out. Does that does that work? Okay. So, anyone who wants to talk about cyber crime and where that's being discussed here. Emerging technologies at the back and content regulation here. So in 40 minutes, we will reconvene. And I will come around just to make sure everything is going okay. We might not need that long. You have to make a decision. It's tough. That's life. <laughs> but you'll get a chance. You'll get a chance to input. Um, are you joining us? Are you joining us? Joining one of the groups? Yes. Content regulation here? Great. Emerging. Okay, so Jean, would you, how are you? How are you?
Ближе, ближе. Council with Access Now, we're a global uh, digital rights organization. I'm based in New York. Um, I'm Daniel. I'm working in the field of internet and human rights. And I'm also for the private sector. We do um, security, IT security. So um, that's why I'm very interested in the topic because it fits together human rights and IT security. Hello, uh, my name is Ephraim Pinerito. I'm with Access for 19. Uh, I do engagement with uh, ICANN and with the human rights issues. I'm Alberto Serra. I'm a program officer at Ford Foundation in the program of uh, Technology and Society. And our work is basically supporting our organizations uh, to advance internet policy from a human rights and from the human perspective worldwide. Okay, we've got a great group. So, we are discussing cyber crime. I think um, a lot of ordinary uses of the internet are uh, being described in cybercrime legislation and uh, these very broad and somewhat vague rules are being laid out that uh, take what was previously you know, civilian digital space and criminalizing it and um, uh, putting chilling effects onto people and also being used in very direct ways to, to put people in jail and so there's, there's a lot of problematic uses uh, as a human rights organization. We point those out. Um, there's also clearly also a need to update uh, criminal legislation for the digital age. And so um, you know, there's, there's a lot of potentially uh, very beneficial uh, reasons to update legislation and potential you know, uses of this type of law, but we're, we're not seeing the trend kind of in the right so, Peter, can you also explain, like, the, you know, the whole impetus we now with the uh, the Russia trying to separate themselves out and what civil society is doing? So, we, there was a whole, I don't know if people knew about the whole civil society. There was a letter that a lot of civil society groups. Yes. But that's still, that's like a crime. It is. There's a mapping we did of um, offenses when committed via online versus offline. The new legislation coming up through Electronic Transactions Act or uh, uh, 
cyber crime acts, you find uh, penalties. For example, if, um, defamation, for example, it's, it's cr cropping up now through cyber crime legislation, which was not um, there in, in some countries. And then if you look at the number of years you'd be in prison for um, defamation using a computer versus defamation using newspapers or third parties, like it's three times, and sometimes in some cases, or even the amount of penalty that you pay. Sometimes some of the penalties just because you've used a computer are higher than someone who's uh, done very crazy things such as uh, um, rape or like sometimes just because you've used a computer you are more penalized than if you had not used a computer. So uh, it's, it's just basically criminalization of the use of ICT. So that's how uh, and there's, there's, yeah, there's something which uh, I wrote when I was at Axis, like this was a trend that was coming up in Africa, and it's just interesting to see the Russian declaration now, like five years later, that it's now going global. It started with a few countries: Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia. Now it's it's becoming global. Um, I, I have another uh, issue which is closely connected to that. Um, what I see is that the, the, the narrative of cyber cybercrime is used to narrow down um, or, or not to to limit, for instance, encryption and to to um, justify, um, yeah, um, trojans from the state and uh, to open up encryption and, uh, and everything, um, which in in the end will lead to more cyber crime <laughs> because uh, you need trustworthy IT. So, um, but at least in Germany the the Ministry of the in, in, in Interior doesn't see that problem, and they don't want to listen to that. They they, they they just argue that they need to have control over communication, and they have to see where hap where cyber crime happens. But on the other side, cyber criminalists know how to use ITT without getting seen. So. Um, But, but, but the last time it's a, it's a more technical issue. Um, but, but the narrative has both two, thi two sides that, that common activities are criminalized on the one side, and on the other, um, on the other side that um, yeah, the, 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 the bloated cybercrime um, narrative is used to, to limit technical capabilities to, to have safe IT. In addition to the issue of criminalization that people just mentioned, and the issue associated with punishment and prison time, as I mentioned, and safeguards, that I mentioned, sorry, I have your name is. Daniel. Daniel has mentioned. There are only two issues that I think that are relevant in the, in the discussion, which is the procedural uh, criminal law. Uh, in many countries, actually, the challenge is not that much the actual crime that you're committing, but the fact that the, the law grants a lot of power to prosecutors, courts, or other law enforcement agencies. In some cases, without even court order, to, to investigate crimes, like uh, real-time tracking of your cell phones, or real-time access to your data, data retention law. And there are a number of measures, investigative measures, not for safety, uh, that are very invasive and has a significant cost. Uh, and the 
sector, the fifth issue that I will mention is also international cooperation. Traditional crime usually has was limited to a territory, a given country. The international implications of crime were very limited, to be honest. Unlike the commercial law that was meant to actually facilitate commercial across country, but with the internet, what we are seeing is that the, some crimes have effects worldwide. And in many instances, uh, there is the attempt to somehow do window shopping for the best fora to criminalize and to enforce criminal law, like what happened with freedom of expression, the libel, label uh, regulation in the UK until yeah. two or three years ago was a clear example of that. So the international implication is also a big problem. Like you cannot achieve, you can achieve a very pristine, uh, appropriate regulation at national level. But if it's being enforced in, a, in another country, they don't have proper standards. It's a mess. challenge that they have with mixing of conversation is that cybercrime is has a very different flavor than cybersecurity usually cybercrime is discussing to the in the open usually in your congress it's enforcing to the open by your prosecutors and somehow reflecting needs defined by the legislature cybersecurity is discussing very opaque environments we don't know exactly who is there and usually it's with little to no engagement from civil society, usually it's by military or defense agencies. So it's, if you mix them, you may go nowhere. Uh, it's but, um, there are two notions of cybersecurity. One is yeah. the prosecutive yeah. view, yeah. and the other is the technological view. And I have yeah. the impression that often the prosecutor's view um, is tending to be stronger because of the natural interest of the state to yeah. have power. But the prosecution is, is very interesting and very yeah, dangerous. As in Germany, for instance, we have uh, loads of new laws which give more power to police to have uh, yeah, stronger investigation methods on yeah. their own life, which, which formerly was divided uh, secret services between uh, police, and this is now in the legislation messed up. So, um, this 
welcome. You're definitely an expert in this discussion. I would say. Hear you well. the substance of the laws, but also the, the methods um, that law enforcement and the governments use to, uh, are, are yeah, they're getting more sophisticated and more access and broader access to more powerful and more invasive, um, not only technical tools, but also um, procedural, like legal and procedural uh, mechanisms. Um, and so that's, yeah, the state is definitely like empowering itself. We also talked a little bit about the difference between cybersecurity and cybercrime. We weren't sure if we're supposed to keep the focus on cybercrime, which perhaps we should. Um, and then, yeah, we were going to get to uh, some of the forums and some of the mechanisms. Okay, great. Um, does anyone want to uh, or ask a question? like technical capacity also needs to be updated. So we've talked about laws a lot and procedures, but um, yeah. Okay, so those fighting crime need technical
But um, yeah. if you guys could speak with a louder voice, because I can hear the other woman speaking with a louder voice, and I can't hear. I just, yeah, it's, she's louder to me than anyone speaking to me, so. Process to create a new draft binding like treaty on cybercrime internationally. And yeah, it's, yeah, very it's really yeah. open ended as yeah. to where it could end up. Uh, could give, you know, Russia wants the power to reach into other countries and pull out whatever information it finds relevant to cybercrime, for example. Yeah. much the, 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 the distribution of material um, actually leads to, to more of, of that kind of, 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 of crime because w w what I know it, what, or what, was, was what, what, the, what I read is that um, that uh, child abuse happens yeah. mostly in, in families um, and this is not directly connected to, to filming material or to, to footage it's just that it's spread out to the internet, and, and this is very, very disgusting. But it, it doesn't. Then, um, uh, so or the question would be in, in how far this significantly um, um, makes the problem more intensive. Okay, that's a regu regulated uh, challenge. Some others in the start have more gray areas that are hate speech and uh, okay, yeah. vision figures. And psychologists judge more, but it's reality what type of part of the We also have some responses by uh, platforms. Uh, to so more like, for example, uh, I'm mostly DNS. So I'm basically thinking uh, about DNS ways yes, and how they're already working on different ways to implement the uh, um, So I'm trying to like uh, connect it uh, so on these how are they use that platform. Uh, what, 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 what,
work with journalists. So I'm just wondering, and, uh, like, uh, uh, how can I, uh, how to connect this technical advancement in some sort of way? Regulations with some, like regulations. So these are just some general comments regarding the forums. I guess the GIFCT is just in the way forward to the more and more society. This is like that we need to be there. I think that having basically what people like to see is like a creative image. Also, we can see how they would have been. I just see a big problem if we reduce the complexity that we just say we need update of regulation, then everyone will say yes, we're doing that. But it's a difference if you um, um, give more power to prosecutors and <laughs> to weaken um, encryption, or if you make uh, people who, who, for instance, who, uh, um, who buy material accountable. Um, so. I'm, I'm I'm not very happy with the, the reduction. Even I, I know what we discussed here, but uh, if you go out and on panels and just say um, updating is, is fine, then everyone will say yes. We're updating regulation all the time. Even criminals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so maybe uh, let's see what other questions say. Uh, maybe we can what we need to develop She's talking about something more than what you usually talk with corporate responsibilities, civil liability. But in some countries, 
we are achieving criminal responsibility also from the companies. But is that something that we should encourage to get companies really on board with the government? Or we should just remain in the civil life, monetary, monetary liability? Yeah, that's, that's my question. I'm not taking position, but one thing is monetary liability. Yes, companies are monetary liable in certain circumstances, but should you as civil society also encourage criminal liability from companies? Like we have in for instance in, in uh, issues associated with environmental law or consumer protection, criminal protection. In many, in many countries, companies are not criminally liable. Like what type of companies that we're talking about here, like uh, content companies, hosting companies? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. But then this would be like liability for intermediary. Criminal, yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, not to say that those companies that are actually producing content also should be liable, right? Because that's, that's a thing, like, uh, are we going to enforce liabilities for the people that are just hosting whatever content I want to publish, even though it is my content, it's not theirs, they're just hosting it for me? Yeah, but it's very different, my perception, that someone is hosting your content on a temporary basis without knowledge. And when someone is running a business, which is about providing a legal content, or it profits from providing hosting for illegal okay. content, it's a very it's a different yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 And also, you have the perception that not not to say that the Russian proposal that we we know if it will fly. It may never fly because I, I cannot picture the U.S. or Europe endorsing a treaty of that nature. But anyway, and the European and the, European, and the Council of Euro Cyber Crime Convention, I think that you should also take it to Okay, um, I'll let everyone finish their sentences, but we're wrapping up now. Okay. Everyone, um, it, there's no surprise, I think, that we have so much to talk about and there we could just continue this conversation. And we will, not just for the next four days, but hopefully for um, the, the months that follow. And so what we're going to do now is summarize what you've each discussed. You might not have got through everything, but if you can briefly summarize in a couple minutes, particularly how you defined the issue that you were discussing in your group, what came up, and any key forums or processes where this issue is being discussed, that would be great. And then we'll have a brief um, in plenary reactions um, so that we can make sure we capture everyone's views on each of these three topics before we um, break very shortly, because I know it's around lunchtime, people haven't eaten, which is just possibly a crime in some ways. And, um, People need a break, okay? I, I understand. So let's start with this group over here. Oh. <laughs> okay, I can't stand. Um, so the group started with a little um, content regulation, but then from the very beginning, there were like some doubts and, and concerns about the general issue, whether or not we were discussing content regulation at the infrastructure level or whether or not shouldn't be it be exclusive to the to the content so the third layer if we're talking about layers but um, from what we gathered and all the comments and, and ideas around here I think that we can sum it up as there is a leg legitimate need for some online content regulation as everybody has been saying for a while um, platforms are increasing their powers in deciding what we will, will not be online at the, and at the same time implementing automated non-transparent techniques to analyze content. Um, also, governments continue to abuse legislation to censor legitimate um, content online and some try trying to enforce um, some of those platform rules which are beyond the law, which was also something that was also mentioned here is that the definition of what is content and, and what is this content we're trying to tackle or address, it's also not clear and it can vary around legislation and jurisdiction. So that will be it, I guess. Anything else? Okay, thank you, Jamila. <laughs>
Okay, great. Anyone from the other groups has anything to add to that or reflections on what was just said? Is there generally agreement on how the issue was being defined? More or less? Just a, as a terminology point, I think we've, uh, we've, I've heard a lot of people not agreeing with using the term content moderation because it sounds so reasonable and moderate, but in a lot of cases it's, it's censorship and, um, you know, with, with really little visibility into what's going on. I think we're, uh, Access Now is releasing a paper about content governance, which talks about like a spectrum of, um, you know, of oversight and of, of different structures um, and activities that, that um, you know, impact content and accounts. Um, also not, yeah, not clear whether accounts are always considered in the content discussions or not. Okay, great. And um, there's next steps and follow up for each of these discussions that we'll go on to next once we've heard from every group. Um, but there's definitely a lot there to follow up on. And so if I can ask the emerging tech group to explain how you define the issue and forums and processes if you got to that. All right, so this discussion <clears throat> sorry, went a lot on the first uh, part, uh, trying to define what emerging tech is, and we've been um, coming up with a list of, um, of items which would include 5G, IoT, NI, and, uh, and DLTs. And we were looking into elements that could um, be looked into or had to be cared about on, on those particular subjects. Um, a list of them would be to look at the implications uh, of each of one of these technologies and specifically what are the, the, the harms that they, that they provide, which is usually one of the things that are sort of over, uh, overlooked. Uh, to have a very specific human rights um, orientation versus what has been also discussed on, on an ethics um, orientation, so there's a prevailing preference towards looking into um, from an angle of human rights. Um, there's been also raised concerns on um, environmental uh, impact, um, real actual cost of the technology, not only about the purchasing uh, of the final tech itself, but what it costs in terms of, uh, um, of production, but also implementation. Um, the education that has to come with it, so for instance, all the technologies that are involved, whether are we um, um, priming them to understand what human rights are, what are going to be the, um, the influence of their decisions, and also look into the narratives that are pushed by specific sectors that may not be very much aligned to civil society, but rather to other uh, agendas. Great. So, uh, number two? Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. So in terms of fora, we're discussing um, two different types of, uh, of it. One, the specific um, technological forums where these things are going to be mandatory. I mean, who, who, who has the, the authority in terms of these technologies? And that would be um, mainly ITUT, um, IGF, of course, in terms of, because uh, we are already here. Um, ISO, I, tri uh, EEEE, uh, and uh, on Another uh, note, multilateral forums, national policy making processes, and also kind of the, the tech main events for each of one of those technologies where um, um, the people are sort of meeting there um, and discussing how they want this thing to, to move from a, um, from a corporate point of view. I, I have to say that, for instance, when it comes to the DLT space, there's a lot of conversation on social impact and social good. And unfortunately, in those panels, I've never seen anybody from civil society sitting there. And so they're basically talking crap. Uh, very cheap shots on, on, on things. And they are, they are preaching to a core that is very tech-oriented, that has no much uh, uh, interest or uh, understanding of human rights and the implications. And we are, we are not having any presence over there. Um, and then on number three, basically, what could we be doing is definitely the obviously is presence, and the second uh, point, work on narratives towards human rights uh, for those forums. Amazing, you did your homework all very well. You completed it <laughs> thoroughly, thanks, this group. So you got through all of those agenda items, which is excellent. Um, there's a lot there. Uh, we'll just go to the final group um, after, I make sure that there's 
any, if there's any reactions or additions anyone has to what Jean just said about the problem, the forums. Yeah, no, so I was in to add that UN is doing a lot of work on emerging technologies too. So they're going to release the the officer of the high commissioner is going to release a report on that. So it's a, also a space to keep an eye on. And in general, OECD does a lot of work on that. And there is some space for civil society to influence the work on the digital economy committee. So just to keep that in mind. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think when we uh, talk about next steps, um, and that will be online after this, there will be um, an opportunity to add to the forums discussed. Um, this issue is obviously everywhere at the moment, um, and that's very helpful. Thanks, Veronica. Thanks, so for the four, I just wanted to add um, that there's also the IETF space, right, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and like in most of these spaces that you guys mentioned, uh, there's, there's, there is civil society presence, but it's not large enough. It's like we definitely need uh, a lot more people. Um, like for example, I'm, I'm part of Article 19, and we do have uh, representatives that cover uh, IEEE, 3GPP, um, IETF, ICANN, but then again, it's... Uh, Yeah, that's totally true. That's, that's partly what I meant with we definitely need more presence. Like me personally, I'm, I'm more in DNS, not so much emerging tech. Um, and it's, it's just like we need more people. <laughs> All right, thanks. Great, thank you. And with, you know, the point of this conversation, I think, is partly to identify where with our limited resources, but collective resources, we can channel more effort. Um, so, and and finally, Peter, before we talk about next steps and then take a mini break, so on cybercrime, what, what did the group decide was the issue and what forums are relevant? Thanks. So on cybercrime, um, we noted that uh, uh, in terms of uh, particular problems, um, child uh, sexual exploitation material is, being, is proliferating and is being shared, um, created uh, more easily, more cheaply, and, and shared probably more easily, more cheaply than ever before. Um, that is a problem, um, and there are other you know, new sorts of crimes that are possible in the digital age, um, and for that reason, we, we thought that um, there is some utility to updating uh, laws and regulations uh, for the digital age, but only to the extent um, that, those, that those reforms respect human rights and are done within a, a multi-stakeholder and open processes. Uh, and uh, that to date has not been the way that, that these cybercrime laws are characterized. They're often more um, uh, interested in, it seems, creating harsher penalties for you know, uh, online crimes than offline crimes, even if it's the same uh, basic offense, uh, including defamation, uh, that uh, a lot of ordinary uses of the internet are being criminalized uh, with these harsher penalties. Um, broader powers are being given to uh, law enforcement and prosecutors uh, who are have new technical tools to use that were previously maybe only available to um, intelligence agencies or very sophisticated actors. They also have uh, broader procedural powers under law uh, to investigate uh, than previously. And um, they're doing so often under a narrative that uh, that says that basically law enforcement access is the key to uh, security. Um, but as we know, that often uh, isn't true, that uh, strong encryption also protects us from all sorts of cyber crimes. Um, there was a note that uh, law enforcement themselves often lack technical capacity and not really understanding the internet or um, able to uh, you know, get ahead of, of trends, um, and there was a need for um, transfer from the IT sector, uh, technical transfer to law enforcement um, in terms of education. And yeah, so then 
that's the problem, I guess. Um, in terms of the forums, uh, two main forums were noted um, globally in terms of unifying and creating more consistent um, frameworks and laws. That was another issue identified was that different jurisdictions have different rules and those could lead to forum shopping um, and uh, inconsistency in application of the law as well as in definitions of things like cybercrime. So, uh, the Budapest Convention is an existing um, treaty um, between states on the topic of cybercrime and law enforcement um, cooperation that uh, is undergoing an update right now. It's being reformed. Um, that is uh, that does have some protections for human rights, um, the Budapest Convention. But just uh, a couple of weeks ago, Russia passed a resolution in the General Assembly uh, that is creating a new process to create a new binding treaty on cybercrime uh, globally. And so that is uh, kicking off in the form of an open-ended committee at the UN. Um, so there's potentially uh, two different standards which could lead to conflict of, of law and frameworks. Um, and so that's something where I think civil society is going to need to to keep close attention in both, I think, the Budapest and the, the General Assembly processes. Amazing. Thank you, Peter. So there's forums there. The issue is defined in, I think, quite um, a complex way. So there's obviously a lot um, that needs to be considered. But you, one thing you identified was the fact that a lack of a harmonized approach is an issue. And that points us directly to the forums where we might be able to engage. Um, just a couple uh, remarks here, clearly. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of points on the um, cybercrime investigation for law enforcement. Uh, the mutual legal assistance treaty process, whereby uh, one uh, country can uh, legally uh, request evidential information from another, um, which can uh, then support the prosecution case, uh, is a very um, long-winded and outdated process. Um, and it means that uh, you know, investigations uh, can fail to proceed because uh, law enforcement agency in one, in, uh, in one jurisdiction can't get the information they need in time. And I think as a, as a result, uh, that is causing uh, law enforcement to look at other avenues to try and achieve their aims. A case in point would be ICANN, uh, where uh, the law enforcement community are trying to uh, sort of push to uh, gain access to uh, registrant data for domain names um, without having to go through this mutual legal assistance treaty process. And that then uh, creates a liability issue for the uh, providers, for the service providers, and um, uh, threatens to um, reduce the best evidence uh, possibility. So I think uh, making sure that we're aware of that, uh, that actually probably the problem lies with the uh, outdated mutual legal assistance treaty and governments would be better focused their efforts in that space uh, than a place like ICANN is an important message to reinforce. And uh, the, um, the, the second point I've completely forgotten Maybe we'll come back to you, um, in which case you're very welcome to take the mic again. Um, and th so that's another point about what is the actual problem? Are we developing solutions that are dealing with the actual problem? Um, so that'll be noted as well. Thank you. Uh, Jamila from Derechos Digitales. I just wanted to add something that I guess it's related and I think it is important for us to have in mind while thinking about the problems in this particular area, which is that uh, governments are still using the cybercrime uh, types to, uh, to attack uh, activists, human rights activists, particularly the ones that are developing technologies. So we had like two uh, concerning cases in Latin America this year. We have one in Ecuador with Olabini. We had one in Argentina. Uh, with Javier Ismaldone, and the, the type of uh, cybercrime that they are being um, accused of is of invading computers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that's something that we have to keep in mind as a as a concern. That is not something that has been, uh, uh, I don't know, 
disappeared or, or forgotten by, by government, and that's becoming more common again. Absolutely, and that's something we heard a lot of in the um, cybercrime group is the criminalization of otherwise ordinary or behavior that is not in violation of um, which, sorry, the, the criminalization of behavior in a way that is in violation of international human rights law. And that is um, one of the main problems that we identified. But then there are a host of other issues as well. Um, and all of those will be captured. Anything else that anyone wants to add on cybercrime as an issue, relevant forums, or messages? Okay. So there was a lot there, um, and I promised everyone a break, which I think is well deserved. But before we go on a break, I wanted to um, just kind of summarize where we got to, because at the beginning of um, the session around 12.30, we had a lot of people here who came to learn a bit more about the IGC um, and discuss some of these issues. Um, and I think what's... What's essential before we leave, um, even before the break, is that we, we understand that this conversation is part of an attempt of the Internet Governance Caucus to reignite civil society coordination on these important issues at the global level. So there are many networks nationally, regionally, a couple globally as well that are working on these issues. But what we would like to do as a network is ensure that there is coordination happening amongst interested civil society groups on these issues that key messages where they are, where we have them, are being taken to the relevant spaces and our voices are being heard in a collective manner. So these are three issues that we identified that were of interest and relevance. Content mod governance, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, um, emerging technologies and cybercrime. Um, and I would love to hear from you before we break and come back to talk about .org, which was the other big topic that everyone wanted to discuss how you'd like to take this forward. There's joining, obviously, the IGC list if you haven't already. Um, that's, that's going to be step one, I would say. Um, but are there any ideas for how we take this forward from the group? Um, I, I don't have a, a, a very concrete idea, but um, it seems like there are already a lot of network, advisory network for the GIFCT for a lot of uh, issues. And, and I think that we don't want to put uh, yet again uh, more and more uh, time uh, commitments for uh, NGOs that have uh, sometimes very few means and resources. Um, so maybe it, it would be important to have this follow up uh, after this meeting, but uh, find the proper uh, time commitment that goes with it. Absolutely. Um, yes. Shital. Yes. So, you want to add the issues with .org onto the agenda, and I think it's. I think we should wait before tackling it to actually see more about the issues. Um, and, and figuring out where should we should go for the next step because there's a, it's a lot of different confusing issues and we, we only go in what rumors out there and what we know and there's very little facts that we know on the ground and I think... Are you talking it, about .org? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, I, I, I myself am not an expert on that. Um, and there has been some resources shared on the IGC list about that. So I know that there are people in the room who can share more information. What, what I would suggest for the .org discussion is that it's about sharing information. We don't have to necessarily decide anything. Um, but there's definitely interest in learning more about the issue. And maybe there are some things that might come out of that that people want to coordinate around and use the IGC um, network to do so. Um, so we, but we'll, we can leave that for an in, uh, more an information sharing discussion, if that's okay with everyone. I don't see any reactions to that. And does anyone have any reactions to that? Okay, great. So before we break again, are there any um, other perspectives? So Camille, you shared the need to not um, have too much work to do after this that will likely mean that we don't end up doing anything or too many commitments. If I, if I can actually add something, it would be to, 
use this space as maybe a, a, um, a space for coordination towards other uh, networks that are already existing and for example making sure that everybody uh, at the IGC is also part of other organization would that be through the crashes call through uh, the consultation that Facebook has, has uh, had this past year around the other sideboard and so on there are a lot of things happening so maybe it would, could really be the space for coordination between all the uh, NGOs that are working on, on these different issues. Okay, so that sounds like identifying all the other potentially relevant spaces, including at the IGF, there are a lot of intersessional work streams, for example, where we could be getting involved. Great, any, any other suggestions for how we can take forward this discussion? Yeah. The, we had a previous idea of maybe um, some ad hoc groups. Would there be like any interest for this? Maybe if we could like try to set up like sub lists or any kind of threads to the topics that were dis discussed here. Just like an idea, initial one, but we can come up with new ones as well. Nope. Any, any nodding of heads, any reactions to that? So the idea would be to set up little groups within the IGC looking at these issues that could as a first step map those relevant spaces. Um, and then identify what the next opportunity is to input. Yep. One idea uh, related to that, Bruna, that I heard uh, one of these days was not to, uh, to create like groups because of topics that we have already defined, but try to create them if there is interest in a particular topic, if a message in the list receives, I don't know how much reactions, that could turn into like a working group or a different list to advance on that and then report to the main list or something like that. That could be uh, a way of making these groups alive. I mean, because usually you create groups and then they are not uh, active for any reason. I don't know. Okay, so... Um that means identifying in one particular situation or problem that is arising. But each group could do that. So these existing groups could identify one thing. So perhaps cybercrime, it could be the third committee resolution that could be worked on. Emerging tech, what would, what would be the core thing you want to take away that you might want to work on with the rest of the network? Okay, like figuring out who is actually going to the IEEE, IETF, these blockchain things and organizing presence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, make sure there's bigger presence at relevant events. Um, and then with content issues, what would be something you think you could spark interest on the list to get people motivated? Is there anything currently happening? Is there anything you discussed? We spoke a little bit about um, interactions between governments and um, tech companies, mm. so may maybe that's a lead way, um, but still like in the same issues listed before, so lack of transparency, accountability, and maybe having actual um, participation, that improved participation as a stakeholder on the development of the, the project and the, the whole like products and, and policies. So maybe that's a lead, uh, an, an initiative or, and thinking about social media councils as well as a beginning for that. Social media company councils, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was just wanted to add that there is an open consultation on the social media councils, but the th I think it's a, it's a process that we may use to start talking about this. The thing is, the deadline I think is this week, so I don't know how feasible is that. So is it the 30th of November? But it's a process to, that we, like a concrete thing that we can start talking about, open to that process. Okay, great. So there are some things that we can take back to the network, to the list, identify more willing people who want to work on these um, and what are the opportunities. So 
Um, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but are there any volunteers within each group for, peop for doing that and working with me and Bruna on that? It doesn't have to be now, but it, maybe there is someone who's keen. Not necessarily. <laughs> so in terms of next steps then, um, I would say summarizing these discussions to the list, uh, making sure that anyone who here who's interested in coordinating on these issues going forward joins the list um, and participates in those discussions going forward. And one thing we can definitely do is develop little strategies based on what you've just said um, to coordinate around particular forums. Um, the cybercrime resolution is one, pr creating more presence at whatever relevant events. And then here, potentially whatever consultations like in the social media councils or other ones um, is something we could do. So we'll be connecting with you afterwards. Um, there's a list going around, a sheet for your signups in case you're interested in connecting um, to work on this afterwards, but definitely join the IGC list either way. Um, can someone tell me what the time is, please? I don't have much, 2.30. We've got actually another hour in this room, um, but I know it's, we've been here for a couple hours already. So what I would suggest is we reconvene at quarter to three, so in 10 minutes, um, and we have that open discussion about .org, the concerns. It'll be an information sharing session. Um, no pressure to solve the problem here and now, no worries. Um, and then uh, discuss next steps, be, answer any questions you might have about IGC, um, and make sure this conversation continues uh, well past the IGF, because the IGC is there and um, we can use it. So any questions before we break and come back in 10 minutes? No? Great, thank you, see you in 10 minutes.
Huh? On. Yeah. Hi everyone, um, we're going to restart the session. Thank you. This one I want to try to get on. Yeah, I'll add you to the... Um, everyone list. ready? Yeah, because I've been sort of in the conversation, okay. but I just have to open it up. Okay, Gather around Bruna, who is an expert on .org. Not at all, but yeah. <laughs> She's our only expert. Not She's on the record. <laughs> okay. Um, so the idea for the second part, the second half of the session, will be to start it with a little discussion on the PIR slash .org. Um, What's the PIR? Yeah. Public Internet Registry. Interest Registry, yeah. Um, so probably many of you, or maybe all of you, have um, an NGO website are all registered under the .org domain. So the .org is one of the, it's called one of the legacy domains, and um, a lot of years ago it was invented under the public interest definition. So meaning that it will serve um, for us um, and for the society in general to, for a general purpose. And um, what happened is that um, a few years ago when the .org was registered, first registered, um, the rights, kind of the rights, trying to explain this in a very non-ICON way, <laughs> but um, ISOC was the one responsible for managing this, this um, registry, register, right, domain name. And um, so they came up with PIR, which is this non-profit, um, organization who used to lead um, the delegation of domains under the .org. org. Um, what happened in the past years was that um, last year, no, actually at the beginning of this year, um, and, and in a, so every single domain registry or register, register they, um, they have an, a contract agreement with ICANN just so in which the terms in which the domain can be used are described. And um, this is where um, ISOC slash PAR at the very beginning, they decided on putting a price cap on the, on the price of the resell of the, the general sell of the daughter of domain. So what that means is that the price would never, could not go over a certain amount, especially if you're working with public interest and working with NGOs, this should be slightly more accessible than other domains. And um, what happened earlier this year is that um, the contract agreement between PR and ICANN removed that price cap. So it was kind of one of the first moments in which um, we knew some changes were coming to this whole discussion. And um, recently, um, PIR, ISOC sold PIR to Ethos Capital, so a venture company. And um, the idea, in, in the middle of all those changes that ISOC is going through, um, the idea would be for them to no longer be responsible for managing this and um, also focus on other things while PIR is now owned by this venture capital company. So what we've been discussing in um, civil society at ICANN too, um, they have been worried about um, some changes in the way we manage this domain and some changes in how the prices will be or could be raised and, and whether or not this, this domain will continue on working under the public interest general uh, motivation. So that is one thing. Um, and I guess that, yeah, that will pretty much sum it up. So um, a few of civil society that I can as well, some organizations, I know EFF issued a statement, so the idea will be for us to 
maybe see if there will be space for us to discuss the PRN.org here and um, if there will be a general interest around this topic. So, comments? I have, I have one doubt from someone that knows very little about how this used to operate. Uh, are there possible implications in terms of a database transferred to this uh, other party? I mean, the information that they will have access, are there any type of concerns around that or that changes nothing? I, I don't think, not, not so far. I mean, uh, at this stage, the, the only thing that has been announced is the resell of the beer, the kind of the, the, the acquisition by Atos. Um, and throughout this whole process, I can also has to approve. I mean, it's it's very unlikely that I can will disapprove this sale and the the, the, the acquirement of the .org. But um, there's still like someone or some that could put a stop to this process. But I don't think it changes anything on the database. Um, it will only like be under the same agreement and yeah, yeah, yeah transfer to the new one. PR will continue to exist. The thing is PR won't stop existing. The difference is that it will no longer be under the ISOC structure as part of their system, but now will be like a different, probably private kind of a structure, so. Yeah, just to say Access Now is really concerned about this. It seems like an insider deal that was not done with much many discussion or you know open bid process. There was no human rights impact assessment undertaken that we can see as to the potential impacts of this sale on affected parties like Access Now and like many of your organizations. We had no voice in this. Um, so it seems like the next step is the ICANN board's approval and uh, we, we're going to sign on to this um, save.org.org uh, letter that's on save.org.org. But, but I think that letter doesn't really go into the um, human rights impacts and, uh, and a lot of the process things. So I feel like there's room for another statement that we could make from here. And access is all on. Comments? No? As Judith was saying before, um, it's, not, um, it's not kind of set in stone that this will continue to happen, but it's very unlikely that um, anything will stop um, this acquisition. There's also another website that's really worth taking a look, which is keypointsabout.org. And they also go through the cell and um, how the internet community, most specifically social so civil society at ICANN, we're not um, necessarily supportive of it all. So the, the situation about the price cap in the beginning of the year and the whole discussion on public interest, there has been slightly not much resistance from, from us as a stakeholder, but now it kind of is, it's kind of showing why the price caps were raised and how this can move um, from being a purpose-driven kind of domain name and maybe we don't know how the future will happen. So I think that about that would be good. Like this was just maybe like a um, sharing information exercise. I know some of us are worried or like interested in the situation, but um, I think if there is consensus or interest around this, we can come up with a statement or have some position on this. And um, hopefully directed to the PIR board and PIR CEO and then ICANN board as well, since they will be voting on the acquisition. Uh, trying to dialogue a bit with uh, what Peter said about the human rights impact assessment and all the transparency and accountability uh, obligations that they will continue to have or not have, or could you talk a little bit about a, bl a little bit more about what exists in terms of agreements with ICANN? What are they obliged to do right now in terms of uh, accountability to whom, how, etc., and what? impacts might may exist or where could we uh, direct forces and again uh, I'm sorry that I really don't uh, understand that much of this environment 
No, it's fine. I guess in terms of accountability and transparency, um, there isn't much space for this. Um, that I can starting to discuss again, or re becoming again, we're starting the discussion on public interest. So what is public interest? How does it matter for domain names? How do we affect it like throughout the community? Um, also the discussion on human rights impact assessment. It's slightly different because so far it's been um, more directed towards the the organization itself and not the actual deals. But um, since the deals are done um, at the very private level, so in between PRR and ICANN, or maybe now Ethos Capital and ICANN, there isn't much private like transparency on this issue. So when I saw announced, like it, at first it was an one Andrew Sullivan letter to the community. When I saw announced the the cell. Um, some of us who have been worrying and participating at the, the price cap discussion were like, we, some of us, they did call it out. They didn't know that this was coming, but so far there isn't much more than this. Check. What I can do as well is like if um, there is space and interest, I can try to set up a primer or gather all information on the PIR cell and share it on IGC just so everybody can understand it. It's slightly, it's slightly better because like articles and bylaws and, and it like involves a lot of other documents and, and things about ICANN. So it will be the registry agreement and the ICANN bylaws as well. So I can share a lot of and compile more information on this and then we can um, hopefully discuss it a bit further. Great. Um, I, think, I think that would be a good start, Bruno, because there's a lot of questions and obviously this is an evolving situation. But we could create um, a thread which just, I mean, there is a thread, but maybe just use that thread to share um, the resources that are already out there, and anyone who's interested can start to follow and engage. Were there any other questions um, when it comes to .org? For those who weren't here, we were discussing the sale of .org to a private company. Is that correct? Is that even correct? I'm not even sure. Um, <laughs> But um, that, that was what we were discussing because that might be an opportunity to uh, collaborate on a, a new letter. There's a letter with, um, that EFF has authored um, that is going around, but there might be, it sounds like there are gaps there in that letter, what you were saying, Peter, um, things that need to be highlighted that haven't, and maybe this is an opportunity for IGC or civil society organizations to coordinate. Um, just to mention as well that the non-commercial stakeholders group, at, which is part of the ICANN um, community and structure, they will also work on a statement, so maybe that's an effort we can mm. just maybe join. Um, I know that there's a draft around, so... Yeah, um, as I compile information on those bullet points, I, I will share it to the IGC today and then we can Great. kick off this. Great, that's a good next step. Any other questions on that? Yes. Thank you. Um, I haven't had time to consult the detail of uh, of this issue, um, but there are a couple of points that um, kind of stood out to me in in terms of caution. Um, first of all, uh, I'm not certain that the relate that the issue of the price cap is directly directly related to the ownership of the uh, registry that uh, that runs the org so they're separate issues possibly uh, and uh, secondly um, dot org isn't uh, a unique space for charities and public interest groups if so if you anyone in this room wants to register a dot org domain they can do so uh, so it's not the exclusive um, space for those organizations. And uh, thirdly, um, domain names are a, a utility. They're a resource in the same way that uh, people purchase a telephone line. Um, 
charities and organizations and those groups who I think we all probably care about and we're coming from the same space here, they will also, uh, in their operations, have to purchase uh, those utilities in, in order to function as well. And they will, in most cases, uh, have to pay the, you know, the going market rate for those services. They'll get a choice of you know, which uh, uh, telco provider to go with, but they'll have to pay the going rate. Um, they may be able to claim tax relief on those activities because they're a charity. Um, but I see, to, you know, to an extent, domain names not too dissimilar from, uh, from other uh, resources and utilities like that. So I think we may want to just take a step back and look at the bigger picture uh, and wonder whether this is really something we need to um, uh, get too stressed about. Um, Obviously, if there are um, elements in current contracts, uh, if there are clauses in current contracts that uh, when they sort of signed up for a .org that said we're not going to raise your prices for the next 10 years, and then they're uh, uh, attempting to roll back on such commitments, uh, then that's a different issue and will need to be flagged. But um, uh, I, th I think we, yeah, whilst it's a very emotive issue um, because of the way a lot of people see the use of .org, uh, we should maybe just step back and caution our um, more excitable senses. Mm, just adding a comment, um, when about the price caps and the relation, um, what happened was that from now on, every single like standard register agreement with ICANN will, will no longer have a price cap. So when it happened and when it affected us, like in general, like with most um, registries um, and re domain um, delegations, was that um, slightly using .org as a space for, and somehow identity for civil society and NGOs around the internet for the price and, and how accessible it was, we felt slightly more um, as if a protection was taken or as if um, a general public interest concern was taken from this registry agreement. So it's not necessarily related, but um, some of us tend to see it as um, the beginning of it all and then maybe um, some disclaimer of what was coming. But then, again, what I was proposing was to share information about this. I can share a lot of the um, bullet points and some other websites that have been, that have been going around. Um, and we can level everybody up on this just so we can think about this standard and actually the statement and actually acting on it or not. So just an initial conversation and thought about this. Okay, I think there's, um, obviously there are a lot of questions and uh, different perspectives and a lot of um, um, issues that need to be addressed. But one key thing it seems is that there's a need to understand what the actual issue is and if there are human rights implications, which would be a concern to a few of us, um, make clear what those are. So we just, we just need to be really clear about that. So I hope that the list will offer an opportunity to do that. Um, we have 20 minutes in this room. Um, any, I know everyone's had to go out, come back in. I mean, some people might come back in from the earlier event. Um, does anyone want to use this space now to continue the conversation we had earlier to ask questions about civil society coordination um, at the global level, the IGC, or anything else? Or wants to offer remarks on the last couple hours? No? Or is it not you? I, sorry, I thought you wanted the mic. Yeah, the issue of We didn't. Yeah, there wasn't that much interest from earlier on. I remember not, there not being that much interest. The high level panel on digital cooperation. Um, yeah. There's a new paper that for me was very insightful, um, an APC issue paper on online content to regulate or not to regulate. Um, and it talked about um, different types of self-regulation versus independent regulation. And I think this um, applies a bit. Or maybe there could be some suggested reading because maybe part of why we haven't discussed is people aren't really aware of that yet. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, thanks for sharing that resource. But I think, Peter, you were talking about the high-level panel on digital cooperation. Okay. 
No, that's okay. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot going on. Um, did you want to say something about that, in case there's any interest here? Yeah, the Secretary General, you know, wanted to do something on digital, and so he convened this really high-level um, panel, as it's called. But you know, a bunch of blue ribbon people came together, did some consultations, as some of you might have uh, submitted to, and they delivered a report with like five main areas um, identified uh, to enhance digital cooperation, both within the UN and between the UN and other stakeholder groups. Um, so we were interested in, one of them is on human rights, so that's the third one, and I know that the OHCHR is looking for support from civil society to try to define um, like what this means uh, as the OHCHR's Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is going to take forward this work over the next 10 months, but what the actual work is is um, pretty vague and you know it's just coming from a couple lines in this report um, that mentioned human rights and uh, and digital spaces so um, just to like yeah put it out there that um, I think access now is probably going to work with the high commissioner's office to help uh, carry this work forward over the next 10 months and uh, we'll definitely want to get the community support um, one idea is to create just an inventory of all the places that the OHCHR has done um, work on digital and all their different standards and, and norms and application. Um, but there's other ideas we have is like looking at 10 different difficult issue areas and try to come up with scenario and basically 10 different scenarios um, like an internet shutdown or like a, a content moderation and disinformation question and look at recommendations for stakeholders is another idea. So, but just to say that it, it's pretty open right now, and if people want to get involved, please. How do they Can get involved? Well, Can I ask them? Yeah, talking to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, mm -hmm. um, technical, um, or just talk to me. Okay. Can I just ask them? So yeah, and um, I, okay, that's a, that's a really. I think it's a really interesting opportunity, very specific opportunity, either to take forward the conversation around how to um, ensure human rights are protected online. Um, the OHCHR is doing this project. We can all get involved. And obviously, Access Now is involved and has some ideas. So if you want to find out more, talk to Peter. And will you share more information on the list? Yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah. There's, there's not so much to say. There's just a bunch of ideas. But yeah. Yeah, if you could do an email to the list, there might be some more ideas there and people who want to get engaged. No, just to add something, um, some of other, some other issue that the high level panel focused, focused on was the IGF and, and participation um, at the UN, at the UN level, but also at the UN level on all the digital um, issues and subjects. So there was some discussions of, and dwelling about um, differences between the multi-stakeholder model and the multilateral model that the UN normally works with. And they came up with two new models of governance for the IGF and for the subjects around um, here. So um, a lot of these discussions you will hear again during the week. So I, I know that there is a few panels on the high level in how to improve and move the IGF mission forward because the criticism for the past year was that this forum was a bit emptied out. So we had more civil society than other stakeholders or, and, and now um, as part of this effort, um, I guess this will hopefully be one different IGF with maybe more participation since we're starting to think forward for this and to check if whether or not just doing the forum and having the MAG, the multi-stakeholder advisory group um, works or should be embedded all inside the secretariat or should the IGF go somewhere else at the UN. So um, this also offers some, some organizational discussions for the IGF and our participation here. So it's, it's a rather interesting discussion. Yeah, and those co um, conversations are underway this week. So there are spaces, are, there's an open forum or there was, um, there was a panel, there's a few things on the agenda which are relevant to this report and its recommendations for the IGF. Um, and the um, working group on um, IGF improvements, which is an inter intersessional work stream, is also looking at the recommendations from the report. So in other words, the IGF might change. Um, and I think it's a very interesting time for it. So 
keep an eye out. I would say if you're not already plugged into these discussions, there are you know a few of us who have been, and we'd be you know happy to talk to you about those um, discussions, but also point you in the direction of where you can find more information. Um, I think for, for the IGC, it's something which we wanted to work around, but we weren't able to coordinate any type of input. So it's, it's a bit too late for that, for this particular occasion in IGF. But depending on what happens here at the IGF and what they decide to do with the recommendations from the report, maybe things will, um, maybe things will change and we'll have an opportunity to shape what happens. Might be something we can work on together after, after this week. Any other reflections or things you wanted to bring to the table? Daniel's back. We were just talking about, we, f we solved the .org issue, so sorry, but um, too late for that. Um, so anything else? Anyone wants to bring up? Okay, so before we um, head off and um, I hope find something to drink, eat, and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. We still got two minutes. I would love to hear from you. Um, be brutally honest, my life is not tied to the IGC or indeed anything really in particular. Um, your feedback on this afternoon and the usefulness of this event and also how you'd like to perhaps get engaged going forward or how you think civil society coordination and the IGC should work um, going forward. Do you have any reflections, do you have any recommendations, anything really, please do share your views because you are here and I think it's important to hear from you. Hi, yeah, uh, so um, I just heard about the IGC thanks to um, Bruna, uh, so thank you very much for that and um, enjoyed the discussions that have happened today. Uh, as I'm sure most people in the room, I have a day job uh, and whilst I find these uh, these topics really interesting, really stimulating my capacity to uh, engage and uh, actively uh, within them and identify all the relevant former is, uh, fora is very difficult. Um, now, there's, uh, there's someone on uh, a mailing list somewhere, I can't remember who, uh, but he sends, every week he sends like an internet, internet governance digest uh, and I find that uh, quite useful. If, um, if that's something that uh, IGC uh, uh, already does, um, that would be great. If not, that could be something that could be quite useful. It sounds like we've got a r real diversity of people here plugged into all different groups, like As Access Now, for instance, and those guys. If there's the ability to um, uh, present some kind of digest, that would um, really assist the part-timers like me uh, and maybe uh, to easily and quickly absorb an issue and then provide a response and thus help me to engage more. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing we could put on the website. We have, there is a website, um, a good list of all the relevant resources and people can add to that. Thank you so much for that feedback. Um, I think capacity is an issue. And one of the reasons the network was created, I think, is to try and ensure that um, people are working together, plugging gaps where and when they can on the things that they care about. So. That's the aim, um, and sharing information is definitely one of the aims of IGC, so we can find a way to do that. Let's thank you for that. Any, any other reflections on this afternoon? And it doesn't have to be positive. I, I think negative is great, because not everything is perfect. Oh, and I would love to hear from anyone else. Yeah, sorry for being late, um, but uh, I enjoyed the having a platform to communicate on 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 hot topics, and uh, so I appreciate the initiative to to yeah give room to exchange. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Daniel. Yep. Um, well, as people said, thanks so much for organizing this, and I think it's really helpful uh, to have these kind of meetings before the AGF, so I think it helps to navigate the event, and also for people with different experience in these spaces, and um, so I think a, a thing that we can think about it is, like, related to the topics that we discuss, there are a lot of sessions on that that we're organizing and papers that our organizations publish, so it would be great to have a space to share that or maybe to map some of the key sessions working on that, the, like the high-level panel one, and so that would be useful maybe for future editions on something like that. So thanks again.
this is something that still can yes, be done. Yes, very good. Yeah, if any of you have like panel sessions that you're doing, if you want to send me the email, I can share it on the list, or you can share it yourself, so we yeah, can compile it. Do. And yeah, so yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be great. So you know, um, sharing information about the IGC members' engagement at the IGF is definitely one thing we can do in the short term. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of the need to share information, which is one of the key aims of the IGC. So. Uh, we'll, we'll keep doing that. Anything else? Any, any ways of improving um, this kind of event? And would you be interested in it next year, for example? And if, it was to be, if we were to host one next year, what would you like to see change? Um, thanks. This was great. It was my first meeting. But I think that I would also like to see, because somebody talked about the APC paper, and I see Veronica is here, to have like lightning talks on the specific positions that um, people have come up with on the thematic areas, but also to sort of like have a regional scan on what the sort of opinions or trending issues around a topical, so like uh, content regulation, what are the arguments in Africa, in Asia, Latin America? So we sort of have like a sense of what is going on because I really found interesting um, when Alberto spoke about whether there's actually any commonalities around any of the issues or the positions because I feel also that based on your context, civil society means something totally different for you know, different regions. So it would be good to have like lightning talks and also just like have a regional scan on the thematic issues. Great, yeah, I think one thing we missed out on today, I completely agree, is having um, a solid understanding of the context and the issues um, that can help us have a shared basis to have the conversation. Um, so absolutely, great. Thank you for that uh, feedback, Liwei. And that's something, if we're able to have this event next year, which I, I hope we are able to, um, we will feed back into. Um, any other feedback on today? Or what, how you would like to see next year's event? Structured, facilitated, anything else? No, great. Um, no, all right. Oh, right, yes. Remote participation was non-existent this year, and I'm sorry, that was a neglect. Normally, Day Zero doesn't have remote participation. Okay, but that's something we can work on trying to yeah. rectify. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's a very good point. Well, and also, there's a lot of um, engagement on the list around the issues that we discussed that could have been fed, that we could have worked on before the event to try and feed into the agenda, and we didn't do that. Okay. Yeah, this was a slightly different format for this meeting. Before we had those speeches, um, and when Best Bits used to organize it, and then we shifted things this mm. year again. But then it's fine. It's a good input. We can work on it, and we can also share the somehow a report of today with you guys on the list, just so we can put everybody on the same. Page. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Bruna. Thank you. So the next step um, for us, for Bruna and I, is to share the discussions um, in written form with the list uh, for everyone who couldn't be here, for everyone who was here, um, and take forward with those who are interested some of the key takeaways um, from each of the groups um, and start planning where we can, coordination, um, and where we need to share more information, start doing that, for example, around .org um, and the high-level panel. Um, uh, the next step is to, sh to do that, to share that information with you and make sure that everyone knows what the, how they can get involved. So to that end, I've shared a sheet of paper with names and lists. Um, everyone, hopefully, in this room has already added their name and contact. Um, but if you haven't done that to this list, please do so now. And, and what I'll do is get in touch with you, firstly, just to tell you what you can do next, which is simple, join IGC. <laughs> Um, and second, um, we will share the report from today. So thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time, for coming back, if you um, had other things to go to, for fitting this in around your schedule. I think you all deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of IAGF, um, and I'll see you around. Thank you.
being more, yeah, active. <laughs>